Rockdown. Hi, welcome to Rockdown. I'm Wendy Stapleton. Our next artist was also part of a family that migrated to Australia and settled in Adelaide, one of the hotbeds of young budding musicians and bands, which would shape our rock and roll history. He was from Scotland and in his teens became known as a great front man and harmonica player. The Masters Apprentices had nine hits in the charts between 1966 and 1971. And though he's been off the radar for a couple of years, he's still been writing and recording new material. He's now back touring again with his mates, Daryl Cotton and Russell Morris. Please welcome Jim Keyes. <laughs> How are you, Jim? I'm good, Wendy, yeah. I'm great. Actually, yeah, yeah, actually, you look great. And I'm, yeah, I look, must I'm just feeling say, good. My hair's even growing back, I, so... I can't believe the amount of hair you have. Oh, I can sit in front of the mirror and watch it grow. I'm watching it grow. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, it's great, it's great to, to see you looking so good. Yeah, no, I do feel good. That's As wonderful. people may know, I've been a bit crook lately, but I'm over it. I know. So well, we'll good. We will talk about that later on, yeah. if, if you don't mind. Yeah, we'll get to that. If you don't mind. So when did you move here? Were you in a, a, a recording band when you moved here? Or Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, we made it in Adelaide before. We, we were big in Adelaide before we, we made it over. What Just, year did you come over? 66. Uh, was the first, we, we, made, we came over and did one trip and, and played about 10 gigs and then went back to Adelaide again. And... The promoters all kept ringing us back saying, oh, we want to have you back. We loved it, you know. So we decided to turn professional and uh, much to all our parents. It was a whole big thing to try and get our parents to allow us to turn professional and actually go and live in another town. Another town. And it's not easy either, no. either is it? No. And back then it wasn't seen as a profession that you took up, you know. So was it always the same lineup? I mean, from, from Adelaide? Yeah, from it, Adelaide it was, yeah. We, it was the same line-up. Um, but then when we got to Melbourne, uh, we had a few problems with um, uh, medical problems, basically. Uh, our guitarist, Mick Bauer, who was our songwriter and, uh, and founder of the band, um, had a nervous bread van. And uh, so he left. As you do. As you do. And... Um, our guitarist, Rick Morrison, had only had one lung and playing in those pla smoky places, he collapsed, went off to hospital and they said, no, look, if you're going to die if you keep doing this. Yeah. So he was out. And then our, our bass player eventually, Gavin Webb, got ulcers, so he had to leave. So it was all on medical grounds <laughs> God, it sounds, these people left. You see, I th the thing what people don't realise as well is that even though you're young and you can do a lot of things that you can't do when you're older... Yeah. There's an incredible amount of stress oh. in trying to not just get around playing bands, but relocating to another city. Oh, yeah. You um, don't have mum and dad to... There was nobody to, we, we, to, we were, to look after we, you. We'd just shack up at whoever's place we could find, you know. And that's too much for some people. Because you couldn't... Well, yeah, that's right, it was. And, and, and some people just can't, can't handle the lifestyle. Mm. And it's, you've got to be pretty thick-skinned. Yeah. Because we didn't have... Because you couldn't rent a place. If we walked into a, a, a land agent to rent a flat... You need a job. ...back then, they would, there's no way they would rent a house yeah. or, or any, a flat. So you had to sort of just sneak in with somebody else. So when, when you lost three guys yeah. to illness, where did you pick up the other boys? Well, just from other bands that were around and that we knew. And... Um, so I recruited them because I was the only original member left. Yeah. And so uh, Doug Ford, uh, the guitarist that joined later, he was in a band called uh, Running Jumping Standing Still, mm -hmm. who were a, a, a hard-edged R&B rhythm and blues point band. Out all the pretty boys. That's all the members that ended up being in the band. Who's this handsome boy? Oh, I've got no idea. They must have stuffed somebody on the front there. Yeah, I don't know like what. like babies, seriously. Yeah. We were just Fantastic. Kids. But um, so I recruited Doug from Running, Jumping, Standing Still and Colin Burgess, the drummer, I recruited from... He was in a band called The Hayes in Sydney um, that were like a sort of a Jimi Hendrix type of band and or The Who or whatever. And... Um, he was, I always thought, if I ever need a drummer, that guy, that's the guy I want to get. And, of course, I did need a drummer a couple of months later, so I rang Colin. 
He said, yeah, he came straight down. And then Glenn Wheatley was the last to join. He was in a band called the Bay City Union, which were a sort of blues band out of Brisbane that came down. That's right, because he's a country boy. Yeah, and he was in a band with um, Matt Taylor and Phil Manning, who oh. went on to form Chain. Mm. Uh, so Glenn, Glenn left them and came to the Masters, and that was the final lineup. Glenn, Glenn Wheatley, Doug Ford, Colin Burgess, and myself was the one that stayed the same all the way through. All the way through. To the end, yeah. OK, we're going to take a short break, but when we come back, um, I'm presuming you took over the mantle of songwriter. Yeah. That's right. what, when Mick Bow left, I, I, I had to do that. You had to do it, and very yeah. well. We'll take a short break and be back very soon. Rock Down. Welcome back to Rock Down. My special guest this evening is the founding member of the Masters Apprentices. It's Mr Jimmy Keys. Yeah. Jim, we were um, just up to about... Where the new guys joined. Where the new guys joined. Yeah. And then you would have had to have taken over the role as songwriter. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. And... Um, what had happened is that we'd, Mick Bauer, our original songwriter, had written all those early hits and he was a great, he was an inspired writer. And they were hits. Great, yeah, they were. Mm. Uh, and, and he was a great writer and, and it was a big loss. And um, we were with Astor Records at the time and Mick Bauer had left and, and they, wanted another, they wanted another song and we didn't have one and nobody was writing and Mick Bauer had left and... I didn't know what to do, and, and um, so I got Brian Cadd to write a song <laughs> for us, and he did. He wrote a song, and it was called Silver People, and we took it and, and sort of reworked it and remodelled it and knocked it around a bit, and it became a song called Elevator Driver. So that was the only one that... That was Elevator Driver's the only song that was ever written outside of the band. But it was in that little period in between Mick Bauer leaving and me taking up the mantle of, of writing. So then, so we put Elevator Driver out and that was great because it was a good little stopgap measure. Uh, did that enabled, chart well? Sorry? Did that chart well? Yeah, it charted pretty well, Elevator Driver. We did a film clip for it and everything. It was one of the first film clips ever. I was going to say, there weren't many film clips. No, there wasn't. Then. No, there wasn't. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, um, that... That, that sort of bought us time while we developed into a songwriting team of our own, which was Doug Ford and myself. Uh, and then we started writing and luckily the first song we wrote charted and, and then the second, third, fourth, fifth, fifth and they, all, they were all chart success. What was the first one? The first one was, it was uh, one I'd rather forget. It was called Linda Linda. And, um, but the B-side... Was that Watching at the Window? Yeah. Oh, I knew, I love that. Watching at the Window. Oh, the pretty cars go by. Why did you say it was horrible? I, I that. hated I it. I love that song. I hated it. I hated it with a passion. And <laughs> that's the right. With those megaphones, like in the 30s. Yeah. Um, so, but the other side of that, the B side of that single was um, a song called Merry Go Round, which was quite a tough rock and roll song. Now, I know most bands did it. When did you guys decide? You, you, you went all to England, didn't you? Um, did you all go back to England? Yeah. Did you go and try, like everybody did, try, yeah, we went try to our luck in England? Yeah, How'd that's where go? we recorded Because I Love You. Yeah, that's yeah. what I'm saying. It was and we very did hippie. two albums at Abbey Road mm -hmm. Studios, which was a great experience. I mean, John Lennon was in the studio next door. Um, Pink Floyd were in what the other... What year was this? Uh, 1970. So it How was John Lennon's first solo album that he was doing um, with uh, Phil Spector as producer. Nice. Yeah. So they were there. And, Who was uh, producing yours? Huh? Who was producing your album? Our album. A guy called um, Jeff Jarrett, who is still an EMI producer and still doing brilliant things. Um, so he did ours uh, and we had Pink Floyd's engineer and uh, uh, a whole lot of different people used to come into the studio every day. We'd have guys from from the Moody Blues and walk in or Pink Floyd and, you know, it was quite an amazing time to be in Abbey Road Studios um, and with Lennon in there and, and Phil Spector and you just felt like you just had to create, you know, it was just, it was just that environment. You had, you, you just, you know, 
because you were surrounded by these people, you just you couldn't let you couldn't let the side down. You know, you had to do some good stuff. Can't so we did, straight. and we we recorded Choice Cuts, an album called Choice Cuts, there, which is still hailed as one of the one of the great prog rock albums uh, in in Europe. Did you stay on? Did you stay on over there after you uh, finished Yeah, we did two albums here. Yeah. We did two albums and the, the, the last one was in 1972. Um, and then uh, I stayed on for a little while. But uh, what happened was that back in those days it was pretty difficult because there was no record company support or management right, or any yeah. of that. And we just rat, simply ran out you of ran money. You ran out of money. Yeah. yeah. And um, we didn't have the, the wherewithal to do gigs because we didn't have the equipment mm -hmm. that you needed to... To, to, to play on the same level as the bands that were around in London at the time. But apart from the concert circuit, I know when I, I went over there, when I was quite young, I went over when I was about 19, there wasn't a pub scene like we no, had. No, so no. there weren't really, a pub, unless you were venues. doing sort of concerts and That's stuff right. like that, you couldn't just go out and say, we need some money, let's go and do a let's gig. Let's go and do a few yeah, gigs down was, the pub. It wasn't there. No. Or if you did, the pubs were so small. Yeah, you yeah, could fit you know, 20 people. 20 people. Yeah. Um, so there wasn't a big gig circuit there anyway. Yeah, that's right. Um, so in the end, I well, Glenn, Glenn was the first to leave. He left the band because he got offered a, a gig um, in, in an agency in London uh, by an expatriate Australian called David Joseph who managed the New Seekers and the Mixtures oh, yeah. who had a hit with the Push Bike, Push -bike song, song at the yeah. time. Um, so Glenn was offered this job in at the agency and he, so he took the job and and it, and it sort of made us a semi-professional band again, you know, and, uh, and, and you know, it just wasn't right having, yeah. having day gigs as well. And um, So in the end he left and, and, and so I called it a day as well. I said, look, I'm going back to Australia, you know. Um, I, I just got married, I had a little boy. And, uh, who is now? Who is now 30, Jamie is 37. What? 37? <laughs> yeah. Long time ago. Um, anyway, uh, so I went, I came back to Australia after that and, and started a, a solo career after, after, after the Masters. You certainly did. I remember meeting you, apart from your recording, you were very successful at um, sort of organising club Gigs, yeah. Gigs, yeah. Uh, apart from you DJing, but also bringing in all these unusual acts and really sort of running quite a few of the clubs, weren't you? I did. I, I, uh, I had the nights, underground. Yeah, I had the underground, and uh, I think it was the the Cadillac Bar was another one. Yeah, that, and the um, the uh, inflation was going. Yeah, in. what's the one opposite Her Majesty's? It used to be called something really. Oh yes, yeah. You know, well, I remember uh, you were running that as well. I anyway, was. that's that's anyway, there, you know. um, Yeah, so uh, so I did that as well because um, for a time there, I uh, I decided that I didn't want to go out on the road with an yet another band, um, so I had to find other ways of earning money. So I did that by running those gigs and. But they were very successful. They were it worked out quite well, uh, and then. Then I did... Books? No, well, I did... No, no, we're talking about this earlier than that. I oh, did okay. uh, the rock opera Tommy. Yeah. Yeah, I yeah. did that. At that South Melbourne yeah, football game? Yeah, I did that. It was, that was great. With, with Keith Moon. Yeah, yeah, I saw that. It was wonderful. Yeah. So I was, was in that. Was it Wendy Seddington? She was, yeah, she was the acid, acid queen. queen. Yeah. Uh, and Billy Thorpe was uh, the pinball wizard. Daryl Braithwaite was Tommy, Tommy. yeah. And Colleen Hewitt. Colin Hewitt was Tommy's mum. It was wonderful. Show. It was a great it was show. A wonderful show. So I did that, and then I did. I compared Sunbury '74, and then I performed on Sunbury '75 with Boy from the Stars, uh, yeah. which was the solo album yeah. I had out, mm -hmm. which I recorded in '74. Um, so yeah, so I did all that and. You know, just kept going, kept going, and kept going, and kept going. I, I think that's probably the key to my longevity was the fact that I wouldn't give up. You know. Oh no! And you've <laughs> you've done very, very well. I might add. Yeah. We're going to take a short break, Jim, and be back soon. We'll talk about what you're up to today. Yeah, lots going on. Lots, lots happening. Yeah. Okay, we'll be back soon. Rock down. 
Welcome back to Rock Down. My guest is Mr. Jimmy Keyes. We've yeah, written so a couple of books. I've, I've got one out, which was called His Master's Voice, which came out in uh, 99. And then since then I've written a, a, a sequel. Well, well, the, His Master's Voice was about me right up until the Master's Apprentices split in 72. Mm -hmm. And then the next book takes up from there. From 72 from and, and goes on. It's tentatively called Didn't You Used to Be Jim Keyes? Because a woman actually came up to me in a shopping centre and, Didn't you used to be Jim Keyes? So, okay, the book is up to the 80, what is it? 88 say? reunion. To 88. Yeah. Now, unless you've had your head buried in the sand, you'd know that Jim, Daryl Cotton and Russell Morris... Yeah, we were doing... 120 gigs a year, which which not many bands, even even your powder fingers and people like that, don't do that many gigs. I know because it's different for them because they do a tour and then stop and then write songs for the next album and all that. But we just keep going, you know. Um, so I don't know too many bands. There's probably a few cover bands around that do, but very few bands in Australia would do that many gigs a year. Um, and we were doing that right up until, well, basically right up until last year when I got sick. OK, so can we talk about that? Yeah. You were in England? My back started to play up and I thought, oh, I've got a bad back, you know. And it just got worse and worse and worse. And I thought, this, this has got to be more than just my back being out. This has got to be something, you know, not good. <laughs> and um, so I went along to a doctor in England and he said, no, it's just your back. Take these painkillers and anti-inflammatories, you'll be right. So I did and it got worse and worse and worse. To cut a long story short, my wife had to call the paramedics in the end because I was in such agony, I couldn't move. I was, I, was, I was in real trouble. So what happened then was that uh, the paramedics rushed me off to hospital, uh, to Oxford Hosp Hospital, whereupon they realised that my kidneys had collapsed and I had no function in my kidneys at all and I was like about a day away from death. And uh, that was fine, you know, so they put me on a dialysis machine in the hospital and uh, I, was on, I was in there for about five or six days and then one morning I woke up and there was a whole bunch of doctors around my bed and they said, yeah, look, yeah, your kidneys have collapsed, yes, but worse than that, you've got cancer. I went, oh, no. You know. Then all the doctors in England and Australia had both said, once your kidneys have lost all its function, they'll never come back. You'll be on dialysis the rest of your life. And, and that's like, there goes your quality of life, because once you're on dialysis machine three or four days a week, you're virtually useless. Well, you can't be doing gigs. You can't can do you? anything else because the other days you pooped anyway. And by a miracle, and nobody knows how it happened, but by a sheer miracle, my kidney function came back. Each day they were, they were looking at the results on the screen and they were going, hang on, his kidneys are coming back, you know. And sure enough, they've, they've come back to full function again now. And they, nobody knows how that happened because one in a million chance of that happening. Well, there you go. So and you, you look go. wonderful. Which was wonderful because I, when, if your kidneys have collapsed and are in that condition, to try and treat the cancer is very difficult because, because it, 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 it impacts on the, drug, on the, different drugs the whole and thing. Yeah. Yeah. So my kidneys being good again meant that they can give me the proper treatment for the myeloma which they've done, and I've had the stem cell transplant, transplant. which is um, quite a gruelling thing to go through uh, because they give you this massive dose of chemo which kills everything in your body, including your immune system. So you have to go into isolation because you can't be near anybody. Uh, and then you feel like you're going to die. And then they put the stem cells back in you again and you just start to come good and here I am. What have we got coming up? Um, well, you, you, you started work back with Daryl yes, and Russell. Yes, started work with Daryl and Russell, which is great because I had about a year off, and I've been dying to get back on the road again, you know. And um, so I, I'm, I'm working sort of pretty well flat out now, till the end of the year or into next year already bookings. Um, but uh, I've just released um, a Liberation Blue acoustic series album, oh, which yeah. a lot of people have done, 
and uh, which was well, well that's, received. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's been a great project, actually. Yeah, it has been a good project. I'm really happy with that. Uh, and, that and then since then I've been recording. I've got another album sort of half to three quarters finished. I'm just... I'm still writing a few songs towards that at the moment, but I've got I've got uh, about six songs already recorded, and I've probably got another six or seven to go. To go, and that'll be so that'll be that's a project for the rest of this year, and probably release it next year. Next year, yeah. I'd love to come in maybe at a later date and maybe do a song or two. I'd love you to do yeah. that. But it's been lovely. Thanks, Wendy. Thanks, Jimmy. All right, darling. Cheers. It was Mr. Jim Keys, and we'll see you next week. Thank you. Good night. Come with us, we're gonna take you away